name is Eleanor Sterling, and I'm the Chief Conservation Scientist here at the American Museum of Natural History Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. And I have the great pleasure of um, welcoming all of you, this wonderful audience, to an evening of excitement about Lonesome George. Um, <coughs> we have a surprise adventure before we start our panel, which is, uh, I have the honor of introducing the Honorable Lorena Tapia, who's the Minister of the Environment for Ecuador. So she'll be saying a few uh, words before we start our panel. So please join me in welcoming Honorable Lorena Tapia. Hablar del solitario George representa para Galápagos, para Ecuador y el mundo el referirse a una historia que conmovió corazones y traspasó fronteras, motivó luchas y despertó esperanzas. To speak of what Los and George represents for Galápagos, uh, for Ecuador and to the world, it's an opportunity to to commove the the, the hearts and um, to transpass frontiers. It has uh, motivated the hope and the for, for the world. Como Estado ecuatoriano, luchamos por conseguir la preservación de esta especie, cambiar nuestras conductas en favor de la conservación. As Ecuadorian state, we have five to to get the preservation of this species to change our behavior in favor of conservation. George no nos dejó descendencia, es cierto, pero nos dejó algo mucho más valioso, nos dejó una enseñanza. Hoy, más que nunca, estamos convencidos que el cuerpo embalsamado de nuestro solitario George será el mejor impulso para seguir trabajando en la protección de nuestros ecosistemas. George has not left us descendants, it's true, but he has left something more valuable. He has left some lessons learned. Now, more than ever, I'm convinced that the involved uh, body of our lonesome George it will be the best uh, help to continue working in the protection of our ecosystems. Ahora que el mundo podrá conocer más del solitario George, Es importante recalcar que fue encontrado en la isla Pinta en 1971, cuando se creía que la especie de tortuga de esta isla estaba totalmente extinta. Por eso, fue una señal de esperanza y desde entonces fue parte del programa de crianza en cautiverio de la Dirección del Parque Nacional Galápagos del Ministerio del Ambiente por años. Now that the world could know more about the lost and George, it's important to remark that he, has, he was found in the Pinta Island in 1971, when it was believed that this species of tortoise in this island was totally extinguished. That's why it's a, it's a key of hope. Uh, since that, it was part of a program of captivity in the Galápagos National Park eh, for years. Es necesario señalar que la difícil situación de esta especie de tortugas en la isla Pinta en Galápagos representada por el solitario George ha servido para catalizar o motivar el extraordinario esfuerzo desarrollado por el Ecuador para restaurar no solo las poblaciones de tortugas en todo el archipiélago, sino también para mejorar la situación de conservación de otras especies que están amenazadas y sus ecosistemas. It's necessary to remark that the difficult situation of this species of tortoise in Pinta Island in Galápagos that was represented by the solitario George has served as the as the as as the way to to the to improve the, this extraordinary effort that the Ecuadorian state has worked to the restoration not only of the population of tortoise in this archipelago, but also to improve the status of conservation of other uh, threatened species and its ecosystems. Es mi deseo que el cuerpo embalsamado de nuestro solitario George nos invite a reflexionar sobre el futuro que queremos 
transmitir de generación en generación el compromiso de la conservación de especies y de la protección al ambiente. El Ministerio del Ambiente de Ecuador es responsable del cuidado de las Islas Galápagos. Por ello, no escatimamos esfuerzo y cada vez somos más ciudadanos que sumamos esta causa que ya trasciende fronteras. It's my hope that the involved uh, body of our last San George would invite us to reflect about the future we want to transmit uh, from generation to generation the compromise that the conservation of the species um, from the protection of the environment. The Ministry of Environment of Ecuador is responsible of the of, to care the Galapagos Islands. And we don't care that we should work um, and we hope should improve our effort in that. Um, uh, every day there are more uh, people in Ecuador that continue working for this cause uh, that is trans trespassing the frontiers in all the world. Tal como nos esforzamos por George, nos estamos esforzando ahora para que otras especies no corran el mismo destino. Porque nosotros trabajamos con las manos puestas en el presente, pero con nuestros ojos y nuestras metas en el futuro. The way we work to conserve and to preserve uh, the species like George, we are doing the same with other species in order they not to have the same destiny because we work with our hands in the present but with our eyes in the future. Actualmente en Galápagos existen 10 especies de tortugas terrestres, las cuales se encuentran en un buen estado de conservación y ninguna de ellas corre el riesgo de extinguirse. Todo ello es posible gracias al compromiso de todos quienes hacen el Parque Nacional Galápagos del Ministerio del Ambiente. Now in the Galápagos archipelago there exists 10 species of uh, terrestrial tortugas. They are in a good state of conservation and none of them uh, are in the risk of extinction. Uh, everything is possible thanks to the compromise of all the people that work in the Galapagos National Park in the Ministry of Environment of Ecuador. Para finalizar, quiero recalcar que George es una historia de lucha y de esperanza. Y ese es su legado. Es nuestra razón para seguir trabajando por el cuidado ambiental. Agradezco también esta tarde al equipo de taxidermistas conformado por expertos, por expertos de Wildlife Preservation y del Museo Americano de Historia Natural, dirigidos por George Dante, que durante más de un año trabajaron a detalle sobre el cuerpo de solitario George para lograr su preservación tal cual como fue encontrado en la Isla Pinta en 1971. To end. I would like to remark that George is a story of, of fight and of hope. Uh, it's our reason to continue working for the preservation of the environment. I would like to thank these, this night also the, the equipment of taxidermist that was confirmed by experts of wildlife preservation and the American Museum of National History. Um, it's that is uh, led by, by the name, I'm sorry. Um, he has worked uh, more than a year in with the body of George, the lost and George, um, to, to reach the preservation um, as he was found in Isla Pinta in 1971. Sin lugar a dudas, esta exposición, además de su importancia científica, es un aporte para crear conciencia en los ciudadanos, en cómo podemos ayudar en la conservación de las especies. Muy buenas tardes. It's sure that this exposition uh, it's very important. It's uh, very important for the science, but it's also an effort to create a awareness to the people of the world on how we can help the conservation of this species. Mm, thank you very much.
Gracias. Thank you, Minister Tapia. So it's my pleasure right now to explain to you the format for this evening. We're going to have a very quick um, introduction to an animal that needs no introduction, Lonesome George, by someone who knows him very well. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with a number of us who, who uh, spent quite a bit of time with Lonesome George and have various ways in which we knew him. And then we'll open up for questions from the audience. And because we're so busy and so full tonight, we're going to take questions um, from cards. So if you see people walking up and down the aisle with cards, grab some if you have some questions. Questions. And then the great thing is that we'll all go upstairs. Everyone from the stage will go upstairs and meet with you afterwards in front of Lonesome George. So everyone has a chance to see him um, in his in his all his glory with those of us who who helped to to bring him here and will foster him on and ferry him on his way back to Ecuador as well. So right now it's my pleasure to introduce Arturo Isurieta Valeri, who is the director of the Galapagos National Park and Marine Reserve. Arturo was born in Quito. And has been dedicated to conservation e efforts in the Galapagos since his youth. He became the director early on in the park's history in 1994, um, and, uh, 1991, and then uh, was the park director until 95, and then he wandered the world. Um, he uh, was uh, traveling, and he was working in Costa Rica, in Panama. He got a doctorate in the management of rural and natural systems from the University of Queensland, Australia. And he held posts with the World Wildlife Fund and the United Nations, in addition to the work he did in the Australia, Australasia region. He's back now as the park director. We assumed the, this uh, position about a year ago, and he'll give you a really quick introduction to Lonesome George. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Arturo Isurrieta Valeri. Dear guests, um, dear friends, uh, tonight uh, is, is a special night. Uh, the Minister of Ecuador, she has, in, in, in that speech, uh, in a nutshell, expressed many of the things that I, I wanted to share with you. I'll try to, to expand a, li a little bit on that. But um, definitely, the, the effort that we Ecuadorians are doing to preserve the islands are and have been recognized throughout the world. Nevertheless, we have not done this work uh, the way we, we are trying to do it more and more with confidence without the international support. It's a World Heritage Site, it's an Ecuadorian compromise, and the Ministry of Environment is committed every single day through the Park Service to give all our best to preserve these islands for the future. Well, there he is. This is our friend, our colleague. And this is the fellow that has brought us here tonight. There's a lot of, of stuff just behind Lonesome George. Lonesome George from Pinta Island, discovered in 1971, as our minister mentioned. Here is the island that how it looks like after various years of conservation efforts. This is where he was when there were goats, thousands of goats on that island. And this is the island that we see now after lots of efforts from park rangers going out there and eliminating the main competitor and the destructive damage that the goats used to do to the islands. Nowadays, we have the island there. Um, I'll speak, with, with, uh, I'll speak to you about uh, the state of that island in a moment, but our scientists, our colleagues will speak more in detail. Here's Fausto Jerena. Fausto is the, the oldest of the park guards, the park rangers that are still work in the, in the park directorate, the park service. He was the one that um, helped to bring Lonesome George to the Fausto Jerena Raring Center, how it's called now, and in collaboration back then with the Charles Darwin Research Station. Fausto is the man that has known George uh, as any other human being in the planet. He has described his behavior, um, a very lonesome behavior, uh, escapish from even females. Um, but um, uh, We've, we've learned, we've learned many things. We have uh, 
learn about uh, putting efforts in, in different ways of preserving species. Lonesome George, we know that he is or was the last of his kind. So we look for uh, international scientific support. Genetics is something that has helped us to understand more of the dynamics of um, giant tortoise populations in the archipelago. And um, we tried to do our, our best. Unfortunately, Lonesome George didn't leave fertile descendants or didn't leave any descendants at all. But there's hope somewhere out there. And that's because of Lonesome George. There's hope because science uh, is, is, is giving us some hope. And, and the science scientific um, uh, team will, will expand on this. Now this is an extinction that is due to human activity. The, the fossils and the bones that we found here at the Natural Museum of, uh, National Museum of Natural History, most of them had gone extinct because of either meteorites, glaciations, you name it. But this one here, this fellow, this friend, this colleague of conservation, died because of human activity. So, um, we have made our efforts to preserve a species, and I'm pretty sure that those of you had, that had been to Galapagos, when you have gone back to your countries, you have realized, hey, what are we doing to our planet? What are we doing to our species? Wherever you live, that's one of the messages from Galapagos. So these are the, the, um, the goats that uh, unfortunately created a lot of damage. We, have, we are proudly, as, as Ecuadorians, can say that we have managed to get rid of the, of the goats that in, th in this case in Galapagos were causing more damage to the endemic flora and fauna than any other species. And now we're getting these little fellows, over 6,000 of them throughout the last 20, 30 years, I would probably say, probably even more, uh, back to their islands of origin. So that make us proud. That really make us proud. And um, again, with the, with the support of you guys, um, we would have not been able to, to achieve our, our, our uh, goals. When he died um, about two years ago, uh, 24th of June, 2012, uh, I, I was not um, in, in Galapagos. I was living in Australia then. And, um, it really shook me. Um, to tell you the truth, I, I, I didn't cry, but I was really sad. I came to cry today, I must confess. Um, it was really shocking. Uh, it, was, it was really um, very motivating uh, to, to see Lonesome George there, even though dead, giving us a boost, giving us a, an energy to think about the things that we need to uh, with the environment, with the species. The Minister Tapia mentioned that he is a legacy. This is the legacy of Lonesome George, where we need to think about what is our behavior to our resources. Aren't we overexploiting them? Yes, we are. Um, aren't we behaving uh, normally towards our environment? I'm a sinner too, probably. Uh, Sometimes I leave home without turning the light off. That's something that produces gases to go out in the atmosphere. And respecting the, the life of, of animals is it's something that we need to think about because we depend on them. They're part of our lives. And that's the legacy of Lonesome George. When he died, the people in Galapagos felt it strongly. People in Ecuador felt it strongly and the people around the world felt it strongly because this is a fellow that is connected to many of us. Many of us, and with your help, will be many more to be thinking about what is that Lonesome George implies and signifies for our lives, for the planet. So this is a little, uh, little message that was written by a local. Say, today we have witnessed extinction. Hopefully we have learned from it, and I think we are. So um, without uh, any further 
Um, I thank you very much, and let's see what else we can share from the departure, the physical departure, but he's still there, uh, of Lonesome George. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arturo. It's um, wonderful to have that heartfelt um, insight into Lonesome George and some background. That um, I'd like to invite all the panelists to come and sit as soon as they can find their way in onto the stage. That um, placard you saw was actually something that we saw on the outside of a, of a restaurant in Santa Cruz the, the day that um, Lonesome George died. So I'd like to um, introduce our other panelists. We have an amazing group of folks here, and you'll hear in a few minutes about how this is, a, is an unusual confluence of people. Um, Linda Cayo is a science advisor to the Galapagos Conservancy. She's worked for the Galapagos Conservation for Galapagos Conservation for over 30 years, with an emphasis on giant tortoises. Um, for over a decade, she w worked with the Charles Darwin Research Station, supervising tortoise breeding and rearing center, including those who are caring for Lonesome George. She's been involved in tortoise research and management since uh, the research for her PhD in the early 1980s and currently leads, leads Galap Galapagos Conservancy's Giant Tortoise Restoration Initiative. Thank you. Johanna, at the risk of making uh, them not clap for you, let's clap at the very end after I've introduced everybody, so we can get to the Good. so we can get to the fun stuff faster. Johanna Berry is the founder and president of the Galapagos Conservancy, which for over two decades has been supporting biodiversity conservation through research, technical advice, and sustainable financing. Her background includes more than 30 years of institutional advancement and organizational development. She's held senior positions at the World Conservation Union, the Wilderness Society, Resources for the Future, and served as a consultant for the Weyerhaeuser Company Foundation, Henry A. Wallace Institute for Alternative Agriculture, and the Audubon Naturalist Society. Next to Johanna is Dr. James Gibbs, who's a professor of conservation biology at the State University of New York's College of Environmental Science and Forestry. James works to apply the best tools available, st biostatistics, genetics, population modeling, to leverage science to help manage endangered species. Some of you may have attended James's riveting talk here in New York recently on snow leopards in Siberia, and today we have the pleasure of hearing from him about his expertise in another part of the world. James started working in the Galapagos when he was 18 years old and has returned over 40 times. Um, he had served as a member of the General Assembly of the Charles Darwin Foundation and as a sabio viejo, which is a wise sage for the Republic of Ecuador advising on conservation science in the Galapagos. So it's a wonderful panel and I look forward to getting started here. <laughs> So I mentioned before that this is an unusual confluence, and I say that because four of us on stage actually arrived in Ecuador, in the Galapagos, the day that Lonesome George passed away. We were there for another meeting, and um, when we arrived, we, we found that, uh, that he'd been discovered dead, which completely changed, of course, the, the trajectory of what we, were <laughs> what we were doing. So Linda, Johanna, and James, that day that we arrived, we had these wonderful other plans of what we were going to do. What was it like? What did it feel like to, to arrive to this loss? Well, I would say, first of all, it was a shock. I think I was on the phone with Wacho Tapia of the mm -hmm. National Park Service, who informed me that George had died. And as, I, as Eleanor said, everything shifted. We were working on a workshop for citizen science. All of a sudden, we were focused on what do we do about Lonesome George. And the thing that hit me the most was I had supervised the Tortoise Center for over 10 years, about 10 years, and worked a lot with George and the people who took care of him. Uh, and many of those years, George was sort of a pain to me, I'll have to say, <laughs> because it was always a struggle, trying to get him to reproduce, trying to figure out what the problem was, making sure he'd lose the weight, gain the weight, whatever. <laughs> so, so I always had this sort of rough relationship <coughs> with George, whereas <coughs> Fausto Jarena, who was in the photo um, and was his main caretaker for so long, had a very close, more friendship relationship. But what I discovered was that every time I opened my mouth to talk about George dying that day, I started crying. So there was something else in the relationship that surprised me. And it was, it was the tortoise, but it was also the species. It was Galapagos, 
years of work um, and always back to Lonesome George. So for me, it was very difficult. Mm. And I know for, for me, the, th there were two things. First of all, the, the, the shock and the sadness was absolutely palpable. Uh, people were crying in the streets. Um, I remember Fausto had a black armband on. Um, but the other thing that astonished me about George's death is how quickly the world knew about it mm. and how quickly it, this message spread within a half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, it was all over the news. And equally, how the entire world community came together to help us plan the next steps. And, and for instance, George being up at the, uh, uh, here at the American Museum of Natural History is a perfect example of how many institutions came together to deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. I just add it was remarkable the day of the week he chose to die. He died alone on a, on a Saturday night, and and um, and he was <coughs> discovered at dawn by his keeper, uh, Don Don Fausto Urena. But uh, Ecuadorians work very hard. Saturday is a very busy day, but Sunday is a day of quiet and contemplation. And 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 that he was sort of discovered on a Sunday, the one day when it could really sink in. He gave us 40 years to think about his, mm -hmm. his fate, and then he chose the one day when it would really sink in. And I, I thought it was all, uh, it was quite remarkable, the timing. <laughs> <laughs> so why does it make a difference that Lodesom George has passed away? What is, what is it about him that is important? Well, uh, I guess for conservation purposes, uh, it, means, uh, it means a lot. Um, as, as Ecuadorians uh, responsible for the islands. The, um, the death of Lonesome George um, was something that um, was taken seriously um, because that ended some sort of um, projections that we had um, with the collaboration of, of, the, of the team. Mm. To you had to plans for him. We had plans for him, uh, of course. I mean, we, we, we tried everything. I remember back in 1993, 94, when that scientist from Switzerland, was a nice looking girl in a way, but <laughs> she tried, <laughs> she tried um, these techniques to, to get uh, uh, Lonesome George sexually active and all these things. Uh, didn't work. Mm. Um, so we were thinking about other, other, other means of, of, of getting that uh, particular species uh, for the future. Um, so when he died, um, some genetic work had, had been already started and uh, showing some lights down the tunnel towards, towards him. Uh, so um, he was gone. Mm. Nothing we could do. No, f no descendants. So um, as I've mentioned uh, probably before, he he internally, I guess, gave us the sense of, okay, we need to do, we need to think ahead. We need, we need to speed up certain, you know, uh, uh, results, certain uh, research that would um, help us to, to manage Pint Island. It's, it, and, and, and from there to, to expand that to the restoration of, of population of giant tortoises. Mm. So he gave us that, that, that push. So yeah. from, management, yeah. from the management point of view, he was, I mean, it was a shame, but he signified a lot. Hmm. So, James, I know you've done some really great work. I've actually done some of it with you, yes. thinking about what happens when tortoises disappear from an island. And so maybe share with the uh, audience a little bit about um, this term that we're using for Galapagos tortoises as ecosystem engineers. What does that mean? Yes, uh, tortoises are fascinating creatures. I mean, they're, they, they, they're, they're spectacular shells and they're enormous size, but, but they but we tend to not think any further about them, but eco ecosystem engineer is a very appropriate term for them because they, you, you can't have uh, originally 300,000 tortoises in this archipelago eating probably one to 2,000 pounds of vegetation wow. per year per tortoise and a lot of not vegetation. basically change Galapagos in, in a substantial way. So they really, they do all kinds of things. They're big, they, they actually break things as they move. They eat vast quantities of vegetation. They, it takes 15 to 30 days for seeds to pass through their system, during which time they're moving all over and, and dispersing plants. All, and so it's been really- With uh, a pre-fertilized package. In a pre, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. <It's>, uh, <laughs> and it helps a lot. And uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, 
it's just good to start seeing them in, in a whole new light, which is they are intrinsically fascinating creatures, but the restoration of Galapagos and ecosystems is actually dependent on the restoration of, of giant tortoises. Yeah, and I know that um, in one of the places there is actually a species of bird that is critically um, important, and yet it may be depending on these tortoises clearing some runways, right? Yeah. Yes. No, it's you. Yeah. Okay. Albatross. Good. <laughs> <laughs> You would never think there'd be any connection between, uh, between an, an albatross, and a, which is a, a marine bird that, that this particular case, the waved albatross, flies to Peru to feed, and, and a giant tortoise that's about the definition of sedentary on an island. But in fact, the albatross need the islands, to, one island in Galapagos to nest on, and they, uh, so there's been a slow incursion of, of, uh, of woody, plant, woody you know, trees and shrubs that make it very difficult for them to land and take off. After 40 years of hard work, the Galapagos National Park Service has restored the, the tortoise population. There's just a question of time as to whether the tortoises will build numbers enough to push this vegetation back before it, or will it close on, on, on the albatross. But mm -hmm. it's a, this is happening in the inside of the island, but it's a good example of how, how complicated and the many different uh, results from restoring tortoise Yeah, populations. absolutely. So, so in thinking about that and these changes that you're talking about, a lot of us, um, when we hear the term Galapagos, uh, if we haven't had the pleasure of going there, think about Darwin, right? So what, what's different about the Galapagos today um, than when Darwin might have visited, when the voyage of the Beagle passed through there? Well, I mean, one of the most obvious differences is the, um, the resident population on, uh -huh. on Galapagos. And, and with the resident population, in addition to the extraordinary number of people that come to Galapagos and travel between islands and from the mainland to the islands is the massive um, increase in the uh, amount of introductions of, of plants, of animals, of regrettably now uh, pathogens. And so, so the Galapagos right now, I mean certainly 150 years later um, after Darwin visited, is is not only facing challenges that Darwin couldn't have anticipated, but is facing those challenges at an accelerated rate. And, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's certainly a worry. So um, you mentioned that, uh, okay, go ahead. Linda. I just wanted to say that, that also when Darwin was there, the Floriana tortoise was almost extinct. It went extinct within about 10 more years. Mm -hmm. And now we have found through the genetics work and everything that there are hybrids with some Floriana tortoise genes and we haven't seen them for 150 years. So, so while some things have gotten more difficult and more challenging, other things have gotten better. We're going to return tortoises the, with the Park Service to Floriana, rebuild that population with some genes that were from the original population that we think has been extinct for over 150 years. Mm. Yeah, great. So, so some some challenges in the in the large numbers of tourists coming through, the invasive species, but also some hope with some of the work that's being done on restoration in lots of lots of areas. So, um, I bet how many people in the audience have been to the Galapagos? Oh, my goodness! <laughs> in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, the description you just had, Johanna, mm -hmm. of people moving back and forth wasn't native Galapagenos doing quite all that moving back and forth. That was a huge influx of tourists right. into these areas, right? And a lot of the people who live in Santa Cruz and, and in the Galapagos are there to serve the tourist industry. Right. So if one of the major problems that we're facing is, is how do you deal with this burgeoning human population, what is the relationship between tourism and long-term health for the Galapagos? If people don't know about it, they well, may not care about helping to conserve and, it. And that's certainly a question that's, that's asked um, uh, of me a lot, you know, am, am, I, am I being a responsible citizen by adding to the problem? I mean, if I love Galapagos, should I come and visit it? And, um, and I would say yes, because what, what in the 20 plus years that I've been working with Galapagos Conservancy, what I have discovered is that people who go and see Galapagos firsthand and experience it are the best advocates and allies, not only for Galapagos, but for, for transformation in their own backyard. And, and when I say transformation, I don't use that word lightly. Um, I still get letters from people who visited 20 years ago, 25 years ago, who say, this was the most extraordinary experience of my life. So mm -hmm. yes, I know, and I know the Park Service, and I know the, uh, the government of Ecuador is taking very seriously the impact of, um, of uh, tourism and different kinds of tourism in Ecuador. But I've got to say that, that I find that people who have been there, um, you know, have an epiphany, again, if I may use that word, 
um, have an extraordinary experience and then become so articulate and so um, so engaged in in preserving and protecting the islands. So from my perspective, I'd say, please come, tread lightly, but please come. Yeah. Yeah. I know, when but I went to the, to the Galapagos, um, we, we had a very, we had a restricted oh. area. We, we, you know, we would go, we were able to go visit some of the outer islands, but we really had um, to stay on the path and to, we had a very short time when we were there. There couldn't be more than one boat at a time in these places. So what kinds of things are happening? Yeah, in, you say Arturo's a former guide. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> he probably was my guide. <laughs> Um, I like to add the fact that um, the increase, or increase of, of, of people visiting the Galapagos um, is a phenomenon that is, is occurring in many other places as well. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not extent of, of, of the pressure of, of visitors wanting to, to go to special places. Galapagos is still and is the most uh, preserved island ecosystem in the world. We still have 95% of its total biota, fauna and flora, still present there. There's a lot of pressure there, yes, but we have been able to preserve it. Hawaii has got 5%, probably 3 now, percent of its total <laughs> natural fauna and flora. Mm -hmm. So that, that, um, that shows us that, that um, uh, we are still having a, 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 an opportunity, a great opportunity, to continue preserving the islands for the future. Um, definitely there's a correlation between, you know, the, the tourists arriving to the islands and the dynamics that that um, generates. Mm. Uh, there's a, a 27,000 uh, people population that lives in four islands. Um, but um, in the last five to seven years, the government of Ecuador has taken a very strong step to um, get policies rolling uh, in order to get strengthen the immigration policies. Um, I don't know if you've, you've gone to the island maybe the last month or last year or last two years. Uh, within the management of tourism, we started to uh, change the itineraries of the boats in a, in a two-week sequence. So now the boats don't go to the same places every week but every two weeks. Hmm. So if you have been there, you still have the chance to, to have maybe your own boat there with nobody else, or just maybe one or two more. So the social impact we have taken care of very seriously. And um, I've been engaged with Galapos for 30 years. And if you go to the visitor sites, you can <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, those visitor sites are pretty much the way they yeah. were mm -hmm. long time ago. Um, so the, the, the increase of, of the increase of tourism is definitely generating or has been generating increase in the local uh, population. Never, nevertheless, there's a night, since 1998, there was a special law that was passed on and restrictions came. I think it's one of the most restricted places, islands, ecosystems in, in the planet. Um, and we are reviewing the law now, uh, making sure that there's those gaps that were left are being filled in properly. So um, it's a commitment. Uh, Ecuador has got a commitment with, with all of you guys, with the whole world. And, um, and we're trying to do our best to maintain those ecosystems. We have been successful restoring some of those. There's pressure there, I admit, but uh, we're not going to give up. So um, 27,000 people living in the Galapagos, how many people visit every year? Um, 2013, we had 204,397. Oh my gosh, <laughs> wow. Okay, so a lot of people had actually gone to the Galapagos. How many of you saw Lonesome George? Okay, almost everybody who went to the Galapagos. <laughs> so does that mean 204,000 people would have seen Lonesome George? Or uh, at least 75% of At least 75% of the population yes. sees Lonesome George. Yes. So, so what does it mean that he's the last individual of the species? Do we feel like that many people every year got to know an individual who's now gone? Is that, does that increase, we should ask that to the audience, does that increase people's um, understanding of the issues, do you think? I would say I hope so. Yeah. Um, to me, when I look back over the 40 years, I knew Lonesome George for 30 of the 40 years that he was in captivity, and for me as a human, 
it was really looking at 40 years of living extinction. And we kept trying and trying to stop that extinction, and we couldn't. So what that says to me, and I would hope to say to all the people who see Lonesome George or who saw Lonesome George and on into the future who see this magnificent specimen, um, is that we need to do the work before there's only one left. Yeah. You know, we tried hard, but there was only one, and what could we do? But there's a lot of species out there, both Galapagos, elsewhere in the world, uh, where there's still a population that you can work with. And mm. that's where we've got to be working. Mm. I think that, anybody else want to jump in? Well, I just, I mean, one of the things that I think has shifted in, in and maybe this is a tiny bit off topic, but one of the things that's, I think, shifted in conservation thinking is saving, spending a lot of time saving a single species. You know, saving George. Or, you know, saving, regrettably, I'm not going to use the passenger pigeon because that was, that was really bad behavior sort of <laughs> all around, all right? That was, that was really awful. But, but the shift away from spending a lot of time and resources saving a particular creature and spending more time and resources considering the entire ecosystem and ecosystem processes. So I think when you start thinking larger, you began possibly to see the problems crop up a little earlier than you would if you were simply focusing on, on, on one individual. Now, George, of course, was very iconic, and, and I know that the, that the world, um, you know, the world wanted to see a happy ending, but I think Linda's quite right. I think people 40 years ago knew that there wasn't going to be a happy ending. So, those of us who were there and those folks who were making decisions, what, what kind of choices did we face, did you face when Lonesome George passed away? I mean, did you, there are a lot of options, right, for, for you could bury him in a really nice place with a very beautiful tombstone, right? So, so why, <laughs> why make the choice to, to resurrect, essentially, his, well, his, his body to hold his spirit? Well, I, I guess um, we wouldn't be here so powerfully, if he would have not been just Upstairs. where he is staying mm. temporarily, temporarily there. Temporarily, yeah, yeah. And, and I think uh, there's a lot of potential, um, and, and we really thought about it. Uh, it was the best decision to have Lonesome George as, that's why I said he's as, 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 as a partner, he's a friend, because even though he's gone, uh, he's still there in, in the shape that he, how he was, um, you know, promoting these sort of discussions, this sort of deep thinking about about nature, about science, about different ways of, of making the species survive and, and, and mm. combine with the, the stability of ecosystems, uh, just going even beyond uh, what we need to, to do to, to stay alive, you know, as, as human species. That, that's, that's the bottom line of it. Mm. Um, so, there he is, and uh, as Linda mentioned, um, um, in order to, to think, in order to, to have more uh, thinking uh, and, and, and opportunities to, to develop these ideas, he's giving us a hand. So mm -hmm. there he is, interpretation purposes, deep thinking about the planet. Yeah, I would just add, it's interesting that there were a, a range of options, and uh, one was to bury him with dignity back on his home island, and. But on the other extreme, you know, I heard crazy proposals. He's, oh, a, yeah. he's a rock star, <laughs> send him around the world on a world tour and <laughs> raise, a, raise lots of money and make multiple replicas. But um, There was an eat him, too. Oh. I don't know if you remember that one. People wanted to barbecue him and eat him as a, as a, <laughs> as a, as a symbol, as a ingesting George. Uh, I didn't okay. hear that. Well, well, I, I got that those. <laughs> Maybe it was just the people who wrote to me. <laughs> that, was <a> th <laughs> <laughs> that was a different part of the experience. Yeah, different right. Right. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay. Oh, oh my gosh. The point is, it's, uh, it's a suite of choices, and, and this middle, middle one was taken because I, I, I think it, did, it does catalyze a, a much larger phenomenon, including all of us being here t today, but it's... Uh, it's uh, it's interesting how, how that decision was made and arrived at. Mm. Where's he I going? I'm oh, sorry, did I... Yeah, I would like to add that um, there was another uh, tortoise that not long ago died. Um, we didn't know where he was, but he was sort of a, this, the pepe. pepe. Yeah. Uh, a tortoise uh, that <laughs> lived in San pepe Cristobal. Um, sorry, you didn't know he died? I didn't know he oh. died. Yeah, well, there you <laughs> go. Um, of course... Um, Lonesome George, as, as the, 
the last of his kind um, means a lot. I mean, mm. it magnifies tremendously um, what it represents to, to humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not putting aside the, 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 the meaning of, of Pepe, um, but he's got a, a, a different story. Mm. So, um, but we decided then to, to go through a process of just, you know, normal sort of uh, transformation of energy mm -hmm. um, to, to have him as a bones for further interpretation. Yeah. But the, the relevance of Lonson George, there's no comparison, hmm. no comparison. So where is he going? What happens he's when, he's <laughs> when he leaves the museum, he's going back to Ecuador? He's in the process of, you know, taking uh, nature, it's, its role in decomposing his oh body. No. Oh, no. But oh, no. Yeah. Where's Lonson no, George? No. Hey. George? Oh, I'm sorry. I sorry, that's okay. <laughs> I'm interested Sorry. in that too, but maybe these guys okay. like that. <laughs> so no, 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 definitely uh, Lonesome George uh, will go back home, home as, as Ecuador. Um, we are um, at the moment in Galapagos, and those of you have, that have been in Galapagos, this, you know, weather conditions are very harsh, you know, humid and also dry by the ocean. Uh, electricity is not stable, it goes up and down. So the, the, the caring of, of a specimen like Lonesome George requires a lot of care. Um, stability in electricity to get a humidity level uh, stabilized, uh, light, humidity, um, air conditions. So we're not quite there yet. Mm. So um, we've uh, made the decision to have him in Quito. We're looking for the best options to have the best museum in Ecuador to, to have him there. Uh, and maybe in the future, maybe in the future when we are ready and prepared, uh, he'll go back home to the, to the islands where he belongs. But for the time being, he'll be for you uh, in Quito, in the capital of Ecuador. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I guess one of the things I was thinking about today when I was remembering the experience of, of the two years it has taken us to, to be where we are now with this beautiful, um, well-prepared specimen upstairs, and I, and I feel like, as Johanna said, so many people took part in it, but for the people in the audience, a lot of those steps may not be that clear. So it, maybe if we just take a minute before people are able to go upstairs and see him to think through what, what did that take. So we found out he'd passed away, and then right. what happened? And then we, um, and you were there. I was there. And we, um, uh, we talked among ourselves about where the best taxidermy might, might take place. You made some some calls, <laughs> suggested the glorious George Dante, who I'm see at the back of the yay, room. Yay, yay, George. Yay, George. George. Um, and, you know, like anything else, it took money. So I was able to send emails uh, to two donors uh, to Galapagos Conservancy, neither, regrettably, neither of whom are here, um, who immediately said, sure, hmm. we'll, 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 we'll pay for the We'll pay for the, the trip up, and we'll pay for the taxidermy, and just let us know what you need. And again, it was finding, uh, uh, it was deciding uh, how to do the necropsy for George, so that was a telephone call to the Houston Zoo, working with Marlene Cruz, the uh, local veterinarian, and it was just all these people, it was you and me and Linda and Wacho trying to find plastic. And Qu James. And uh, yeah. James, sorry, and trying to find plastic to wrap him, put him in the freezer, a year or so. Finding a or freezer big enough for him? Yeah, finding a freezer yeah. big enough, making which, sure he was which frozen. Which was free for nine months? Yes, making sure he was frozen at the right temperature. Then James, the, the unsung hero, um, was the gentleman who escorted George's body back from Puerto Ayora to Guayaquil, from Guayaquil to New York, where basically he got rock star status. I yeah. do remember getting these emails saying, George is, you know, in the Lincoln Tunnel. George is <laughs> <laughs> George is, he's almost here. George got stuck. George is, you know, just like, whoa, George is finally here. Well, narrow. it was important because he was frozen and we wanted him yeah. to stay frozen. So James had uh, auxiliary freezers in the airport in case the plane didn't leave and the whole thing oh was... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The remar most remarkable thing is our great worry was he would be too thawed and for George Dante to do his work when, when, when we arrived and we opened up the... the Park. Biting our nails. Up goes down to the park service. They made a beautiful box, box yeah. for him. Opened that up, unwrapped roll after roll of Pink Panther insulation, <laughs> and 
took then the plastic off, and then there was George. He was literally covered with frost. Yeah. And so he couldn't have arrived in better shape thanks to the year of care uh, in Galapagos, which isn't so easy with the variable electricity. Exactly. And then, uh, all of the care and that, 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 that we encountered on the way. It was really quite remarkable. Well, but it was like stone soup, right? Because the Pink Panther, yeah. uh, um, how did that get there? How did the insulation get there? That wasn't at the hardware store when I was there. <laughs> no. How did it get there? Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> I remember. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Eleanor was actually there for a citizen workshop, citizen science workshop. Okay. But we had another workshop planned two weeks later for giant tortoises. And we had already planned this before Lonesome George's right. death. And then his death just stimulated us to do better A lot of people came job. down with rolls of So insulation. we wrote all the people coming to the tortoise workshop and said, bring insulation <laughs> to pack up Lonesome George. And so everybody yeah. was flying down with rolls of insulation. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was quite an effort. But one thing I wanted James to just mention was the experience I'd that you had it. taking Lonesome George from Puerto Ayora, the town in Galapagos, to the Baltra Airport. Mm. Yeah, I'm utterly privileged to have been the designated courier for the tortoise. And, uh, <laughs> there's, Is uh, that on your CV? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but it, it started off... You know, a pre-dawn with, uh, with just a couple of park guards so working quietly, um, pulling George out of the freezer, getting him into his box, getting him wrapped up and getting him secured in, inside in this beautiful box. But then it was kind of, uh, the point was to get him safely to New York so there was no news about people along the way, you know, what is that 500 pound box? And when you told people, literally, people really would go over and touch the box, people would cry, people would tell stories. Uh, and this was just getting to the airport. Um, and uh, <laughs> then the help, uh, you know, we started all alone in the dark, but the help at every point of the way then just sort of mushroomed, including in Guayaquil at night, in the middle of the night, the volume of people that came to make sure this, this went through. So it was, it was really quite touching, the, uh, the response. And I can only imagine the response when he goes home. Mm. Uh, I do mm. remember the one picture that I, uh, iconic picture of George's box and said, American Museum of Natural History, you know, gave the address, you know, fragile. That's it. So <laughs> people said, how do you get George from point A to point B? Well, put him in a big Mail box. him. <laughs> Mail him. <laughs> Sorry, Arturo. Arturo. I, no, I, 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 I like to, to, to say that um, I, I wasn't in, in the country when that happened. Um, but um, uh, I, I have asked, and, and have you been recording all this? And um, said, yeah, we have tons of pictures, you know, uh, pictures that are more to, to, to the eyes of the scientists and, and, and managers than to the, to the public. But there's a whole bunch of them uh, that we can put together and, and mm -hmm. build up the story. But I just found out today that um, a friend, uh, um, a journalist that works for the Ecuadorian television has recorded uh, quite a bit of, of the story of Lonesome George coming to New York, and you know, I was very pleased to see him here. So uh, th this is more or less three quarters of the way. Mm -hmm. so we still <laughs> have some time, <laughs> some adventures, and the return so journey. Yes, we have the return journey. That that um, it'll be it'll be nice. It'll be nice yeah. to put up something that uh, that we can share with with the whole world about this, this unique story of mm. Lonesome George. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So anyways, that's something we can share with you, with the four or several of us on stage that you wouldn't get anywhere else. We, yeah. we haven't <laughs> done this dog and pony show, and I'm not sure we're taking it on the road. <laughs> 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 um, I just wanted to ask one quick question, and then hopefully we're collecting questions from the audience. I'm sure you have some terrific questions for these panelists. Um, how do you see the Galapagos in 20 or 50 or 100 years from now, and where are we going, essentially? What, what are your thoughts on that? For me, I, when we talk about the uninhabited islands, and, and certainly based on a lot of the, the restoration work that, that the park is, is doing with Galapagos Conservancy and other, and other organizations, I think that we, we see an almost untouched or, or even more vibrant um, uh, landscape on the on the uninhabited islands. It's the, it's, the, it's the inhabited islands that are going to be the, the real challenge. And I think that the, that the government of Ecuador has put some really important um, uh, milestones in place in terms of their vision for these, for these islands and their vision for how um, the, the, the human population is going to interact with, um, with the flora and the fauna. But there's, there's no question that um, 
that with the resident population and with, and with tourism, there are some significant challenges on the uninhabited, I, I mean, on the inhabited islands. And so, so I think that's the, I think in the next 10 years, we're really going to see that some of the, some of the government's programs in, in Buen Vivir, for instance, are going to, you know, are going to shift the trajectory and that's going to be critical. I, I think that um, as time goes by, um, we need to we need to learn from the past. Like for example, genetics. You know, there's there's a lot of advances in genetics, and they are helping us to make decisions. So we just wanted to call out. I think um, our geneticists are in the audience, and wish we could have them up here on stage. Uh, Gisela Kukoni. Kukoni. Way in the back. Yale University. <laughs> Excellent work is happening. Um, but um, uh, the government of Ecuador is just um, committed to maintain the islands as much as possible uh, for the future. Uh, I agree, the uninhabited islands um, will be the ones that will show uh, recovery, but the inhabited islands are the ones that are gonna be harder to, to, to deal with. Um, I must say that, that um, there is a lot more conscious uh, behavior um, nowadays. There's a culture the, an island culture of, of respecting the the, um, the fragile ecosystem that that uh, exists on the islands. There are there are people that still are not quite there yet. But <laughs> I would like to add that uh, with example of, of technology, we, we we might find easier ways to to also combat the the introduction of a species. You know either. Um, other uh, methods of doing it, or even controlling, mm -hmm. um, uh, inspecting before the cargo goes to the islands. Mm. So those are the things that uh, we, we don't know how much technology will improve and that will help us. I'm an I'm, I'm uh, optimist. Excellent. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, we'll have Galapagos still as the most pristine uh, island ecosystem in for many, many decades. And I would just talk from the tortoise perspective, since we're here because of Lonesome George. And this giant tortoise restoration initiative is building on 50 years of tortoise conservation work by the Galapagos National Park Service, the Charles Darwin Foundation, and many others. And this workshop that we had right after Lonesome George's death, we planned the next few decades of tortoise restoration. and. The vision is, as James has done a lot of work on this and estimates that Galapagos used to have about 300,000 tortoises. We now have about 20,000. We have a long way to go, but we have a plan to get there. And I would say in terms of tortoises, it's extremely optimistic future. One, one, um, one project that uh, is on the table is the Floriana restoration project. Mm -hmm. And when got into the, into office uh, about a year ago, um, it was to me it was the, the the best of the challenges because that includes a human population, and uh, Floriana has only got 150, but hey, <laughs> 150 committed to restore an island that is inhabited, that has cattle, that has pigs, domestic domesticated, that has a. a dogs there and so on. So that's where the challenge is, is, is to work with the community and, and provide an example. It's a, it's a huge pilot project where it will need not only the most um, uh, deep expertise from scientists uh, to restore, to eliminate uh, the particular rats, which are the main, main problems, uh, and how that is going to be dealt with the human population, even though it's a small that live there and they have their own domesticated islands and, and a community that is developing a community tourism uh, activities. Um, so let's hope that uh, we have the, the, the unity of, of uh, because not only Floriana, that will require a lot of political support at the local level and, at, and we have at the, the highest level, mm -hmm. but it will take a lot of, uh, a lot of effort to, to have Floriana being restored. Mm -hmm. So hopefully in 10 years we'll have something, some more good news for everybody. So we're just starting, it's a long, long journey, but that's the first time that a human population is included in a restoration of its 
unique ecosystem. We have some wonderful questions from the audience. So you can take us a little bit back into what is a tortoise and mm. what do we know about them. So let's start with um, some quickie, easy ones. Um, what's the normal lifespan of a giant tortoise? Okay, I'll take that one. Excellent. <laughs> I'm not at all, so you that. <laughs> um, we're still guessing. Uh, most of us who work with tortoises and have looked at this and look at old records and things would say 150 to 200 years. Um, so Lonesome George actually died sort of probably 100, 120 years old, um, sort of midlife, but not all of them live that long anyway, but very, very old animals. And unfortunately, so far, we haven't had any scientists following an individual <laughs> until it dies, so we don't know how long they actually live. That would take a special scientist yeah. Yeah, following from birth to <laughs> I think it has to be a tortoise. Yeah, a, a tortoise scientist. Yeah, tortoise Excellent. Scientist. You've been fostering those behind our backs, yeah. haven't you? Uh-huh. Well, go ahead. It does raise the interesting possibility that a living tortoise in Galapagos gazed upon Charles Darwin. I, yes. I just yeah, it's an amazing to think about. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions from the audience is actually, uh, Lonesome George was a, as a giant tortoise. With his death, does that mean there are no giant tortoises left in the world? What types of tortoises are the, those? in the photo that you were showing the young. So let's s well, go back a little bit and think about well, giant tortoises. They used to be spread all around the world, right? Lots and lots of different places. Where are they distributed now? Am I doing that one? You're too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There, uh, there are giant tortoise fossils from all continents except Antarctica. And the only places in the world that they live naturally now are the Galapagos Islands <laughs> and the Aldabra Atoll in the Indian Ocean and they have gone extinct everywhere else. Um, so giant, giant tortoises, how many is different species are there in the Galapagos? Jay. Oh, a very weighty question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, because they're big? We have two answers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, we have two answers. The official answer? Yeah. yeah they're still uh, broadly treated in many, many cases as a single species, but clearly they're not, uh, just looking at them and uh, all the genetic evidence, the behavioral morphological evidence, but um, it will take some effort to, uh, uh, scientists are going ahead and publishing and they have for the last five or 10 years as them being different species on different islands. So it's a confusing time, uh, but it will take a concerted effort by, uh, by the tortoise experts uh, to, uh, to actually grapple with this and describe there's not that many species of turtles on the planet and just uh, over 250 so this will be a I suspect at the end of this there may be nine or or ten uh, uh, please speak with Gisela Coconi in the back afterward uh, nine or ten species uh, come out of this but it, it's it they've not been formally described even though everyone's treating them as different species but the Go ahead. scientists they say that, that there used to be 14 mm. and now there's 11 I see yes ten with oh, Lonsome George, George died. But yes. we're all agreed on the stage on that, so it was a good question. We have lots of answers to that question. So what makes Lonesome George so different from the other uh, Galapagos tortoises? Just a little bit of uh, a primer on why these Pinta tortoises were distinct. Okay. Um, <laughs> in Galapagos, there's two major types of tortoises. Large dome tortoises where the carapace comes down in the front and they graze primarily off the ground. They're found on large high islands where there's a lot of different vegetation zones and there's usually plenty of food low down. So that's the ancestral tortoise that came to Galapagos, probably landed on San Cristobal, um, eventually dispersing out to other islands. And from what the geneticists tell us, each time it arrived on a dome tortoise or any tortoise that arrived on an arid island that's low, flat, not much vegetation, has a period of drought almost every year, sometimes droughts very long. The main food item is cactus and they're tall trees so they have pads drooping down. So over and over the evolution of these tortoises on arid islands started getting this saddleback shape where the, the carapace comes up in the front the legs are longer, the neck is longer, and the tortoise can actually reach up to the cactus pads, which these dome tortoises would never even try. Uh, so, so Lonesome George was a saddleback tortoise. And the sad thing in Galapagos is this is a very special Galapagos tortoise. Dome tortoise is sort of the typical 
It's the same Aldabra dome tortoises. Saddlebacks evolved in Galapagos multiple times, and all of the extinct tortoise species are saddlebacks. So, so for me, losing Lonesome George, that's losing one more saddleback population. Española, which many of you have seen uh, the breeding program on Santa Cruz Island, their saddlebacks and Pinzon tortoises saddleback. But we lost saddlebacks on Santa Fe, Floriana, Fernandina, and Pinta. So there are very special tortoise only found on Galapagos. They're the Spanish saddle also had the name Galapago. That's where the islands got their name. So for me, saddleback tortoises, you know, are are the oh, best. So Iconic. <laughs> yeah. I just um, I'm realizing that some of us are maybe making the assumption that everybody in the audience knows where Seychelles is. Where are the Where are the Seychelles? Coast of Africa. Okay, Indian Ocean. I'll take that. That sounds good. Excellent. <laughs> so those are the other uh, the other giant tortoises are. Um, I'm gonna, uh, there are lots more questions about natural history that we might come back to, but I'm gonna ask a fun question. Please tell us a bit about Lonesome George's personality. <laughs> oh, God. There you go. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I just heard stories, but yeah. I, think, I think Linda has Dang, been... Uh, been and James and Linda have had <laughs> okay. some up close and personal. Lonesome George, you have to understand this tortoise lived most of his life alone out there on Pinta. There might have been another tortoise or two um, in the early 1900s, et cetera. F there were some found killed by fishermen. Um, so when he got into captivity, he didn't like humans very much. He didn't like tortoises very much. You know, he sort of was solitary. Uh, the one friend he made that lasted for years is Fausto de Reina. The, the park warden who took care of him the longest, and the two of them really bonded over the time. Um, Lonesome George, I would say, was a difficult tortoise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when we put, first put females with him, he didn't like them. And I had gotten um, recommendations from other scientists saying, put him with some males and females, get the males to stimulate him, and, and he might compete and go after the females and all this stuff. And so in the early 1990s, there was a period of conflict in Galapagos um, when the sea cucumber fishery began. It was, there was a lot of illegal fishing. Uh, fishermen started having major camps out on the islands. Um, and they, there was a major conflict between fishermen and the whole sort of conservation community. So the National Park Service, the Charles Darwin Foundation, and they would close the park, do protests, the park headquarters, rather. Um, and one of the things that happened was we kept hearing a threat against Lonesome George's life. OK, I didn't really believe it, but I didn't want to be the person who said, well, I didn't believe it, so I left him there. <laughs> and then you know, fishermen <laughs> came in to kill him. So we switched him. We switched him with actually with a female, but she looked kind of like him. <laughs> um, and I figured the fisherman wouldn't know. So we put Lonesome George into a crowd with a bunch of other tortoises, both male and female. And I thought, OK, perfect opportunity. Exactly. We'll see if the males get George more active and after the females. But after not very many days, George had about a third of the corral. That was his territory. Nobody else could come in there. Wow. <laughs> and all the rest of the tortoises were out there. So George was, you know, a different kind of animal. He, he listened to his own drummer. <laughs> I, I would just add that George Dante has captured this quirky personality exquisitely. If you go and you see the tortoise, you yeah. look, he's... He's bold, he's curious, <laughs> he's bold, he's curious, but if you look his tail, it's tucked in tightly. He's also a little, <laughs> he's a little timid. Yeah. He sort of captures the... Th That's the great. Little, so. It's true. That'll be fun to look at when we get to go upstairs. That was, uh, that was a lyric. That was wonderful <laughs> to, to think about those. So, James, um, I'm going to give you two questions at once because I think they're somewhat related. What's the reasoning behind sterilizing 39 tortoises and releasing them on Pinta versus releasing viable genetically diverse population that could begin um, speciation and adapting, um, evolving back to the island? And <laughs> once the tortoises are back on the island, are you letting them breed normally or a selective breeding practice? Do you aid in the survival of baby tortoises, like keeping wow. predators away or let nature take its course so, and see who survives? They're somewhat related. Uh, operational questions about the, the tortoise restoration work. It could be actually for mm -hmm. both of you, I think, for, for, 
for uh, Arturo as well, and thinking about s some of the restoration work. But How about I feel the first part of it and Arturo? All right. Okay. I'll the first part, there actually are tortoises on, on Pinta Island right now. Uh, there are 39. Um, they were uh, animals that had been in captivity that were either were hybrids and didn't really have anywhere to go or, um, or their, their native populations didn't, didn't need them and potentially their issues of vectoring diseases by returning them. So they were, they were uh, used to actually basically to test the concept of, uh, of the viability of reintroducing tortoises to Pinta Island. And also the island simply needs tortoises. These are, uh, this is again more than about restoring tortoises, it's about restoring ecosystems. And while this complicated decision-making is process uh, unfolds about what to put on that is reproductive on Pinta that evolution will continue to shape. It still needed some tortoises in the interim. So, so these were basically released um, as uh, to, 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 to also, also prepare the habitat for the tortoises that would come eventually, but just to buy time in this complicated decision making process to what should go on Pinta that is reproductive. Mm -hmm. And not, not to sound uh, sappy, but it also gave tortoises that would never have had a chance to live out their natural life in the wild a chance to do that. That's a good answer, yeah. yeah. You know, for us, um, we, we follow the, um, the um, sounded uh, research, um, the, the logics of, of uh, uh, dynamics of ecosystem um, health, and energy flow. So we thought, um, yes, okay, uh, there's 39 out there. Well, that was, they were mm -hmm. kept in this corral for many, many years, um, sterilizing them and having an opportunity for them to play a role in, in preparing the island uh, for the next step, which will be to uh, think about putting those tortoises that have still some genetic material from Pinta uh, are hybrids, but that um, eventually uh, with maybe decades or 100 years or something, we won't live to, to see the, the reproduction uh, and the restoration of a, a much more pure genetic pool from, from Pinta Island was something that, um, that was well um, uh, thought and decided to, to, to give it a try. The, the island itself needed tortoises. Um, and as it was mentioned, you know, who would think that, that a tortoise would be connected with the al albatross from Española Island? Um, definitely there's a connection uh, on, on the roaming, on the uh, branching, breaking, as the tortoises go and, and, and just generate a spaces for other plants, for other animals. So I think it was the, the best decision um, to, to have Pinta uh, in, in that move. And, and learning from, from that too for the restoration of other islands, which are on, on the track too. Hmm. Apparently, a number of people in the audience are asking the same question, so I'm going to ask it now. Can you address the topic of de-extinction, cloning, et cetera, and rewilding? Yeah. You want to take that, James? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will take it. Uh, only because I have strong opinions about it. I, I think it's a it's an elegant idea uh, to be discussing resurrecting mammoths, and uh, but there are de-extinction issues every day that we are not addressing, and those have to do with populations. In terms of what we really need to be focusing on right now, there's a huge amount of genetic variation, as much being lost in the extinction of local populations of of extant species as there is in the actual extinction of outright extinction of, of species, and we. Uh, we really, in terms of bringing creatures back, viable populations and ecosystem services, we really need to be focusing on de-extinction, but back at the population level, these grand schemes are, are great. Maybe they're appropriate in certain con contexts, but we have a lot on our hands right now be without engaging, bringing mammoths back to the Adirondacks. <laughs> I, I would just add one thing too, is that we also don't want to focus so much on de-extinction that over here where we're not paying attention, species are just going extinct one right. after the other. Right. So we got to work over here a lot and make sure species are not going extinct. There are a lot of other issues that relate to the, 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 the cloning and the, and the reintroduction of organisms that have never been in an environment before. Right. Are they invasive? If they haven't been there for several hundred years, they don't know right. the behaviors to be able to survive and interact. There's, there's so many things I guess we could spend. There is, in fact, a session in October on de-extinction here at the museum, so come back. <laughs> um, 
So, Johanna, here's a, a question oh. for you. It says, are there other species in the Galapagos that are um, now critically endangered and face possible extinction? Yes, <laughs> there are. And thank you for <laughs> thank you for moving this slightly away from a tortoise centric. Yeah, um, yeah it's, but it's going to be it's going to yeah. be whipped back any moment now. Of course. I, I know it. It's going to be whipped back into tortoises. That's but right. Uh, George is happy of <laughs> uh, discussing yes. yes. other species. Yes, but there are. I mean, there are uh, there are endangered uh, plant species that people aren't aren't talking about. There are um, endangered uh, land snails. They may even be gone now. There is a whole level of invertebrate species that are. Uh, that are threatened. Um, one of the most, I think, vulnerable populations in Galapagos um, include all the land birds, who are, um, you know, this is these are the, the mangrove finches and the and the and the warblers and the vermilion flycatchers, who are falling victim to a variety of issues. Um, some have to do with um, uh, uh, landscape um, rearrangement, where uh, lands are cleared for, say, um, agriculture. And so birds that are used to perching in places don't have any place to perch. There's the use of chemicals um, in agricultural lands that may be affecting, um, you know, uh, passerines, the, the perching birds. There's, um, there's avian pox and now uh, an introduced bot fly called Falornis downsy. Charlotte Costin is in the audience and will point her out because she, she, is, she is the expert working on, on Falornis now. But we've got all these, these, these other um, um, Organisms in Galapagos, including in the marine environment as well, that are that are falling victim, and we need to, as Linda and James have been saying, we don't want to take our eye off of, of, of these individuals. But I would like to give a shout out to plants, that you know, <laughs> that, uh, for the two botanists that might be in the room, but there, <laughs> but there, there. I mean, there are, uh, you know, there's there's glory in in, in all these species, and um, let's you know, let's take a moment to think about what we're doing. Um, for those processes as well. Uh, we have a number of questions that relate to management, so I think we're going we're gonna to run into these. So they're, good evening, Mr. Izurieta. My name is, uh, Kat, I'm sorry, Katia Kubos, who's a student, <coughs> a student from George Washington University. What kind of sustainable tourism models uh, is the park taking into consideration for hotel com accommodations in the islands? And I'm going to say that there's another one. That's how much renewable energy does Galapagos have now, and what are the goals for the future in terms of wind, solar, and water? OK. Thank you for that question. Um, last year, uh, the president of Ecuador, economist uh, Rafael Correa, in June, went to the islands and um, he realized that um, there was a question that was not, had not been answered properly yet. And he said, how many tourists can the islands hold? So um, when I came uh, uh, as director, of the minister here present, it was the first ta task <laughs> she assigned to me and said, the president has requested this. I have committed to uh, do the study. And um, there you go. So here you go. This is the, the thing that we, we need to do as Ministry of Environment. So um, we, we finished the study in, in May. That was last September. We finished the study in May. Uh, a pretty much uh, in-depth study. There's a lot of things that still need to be um, put together. But it's, um, it's the first time that uh, Galapagos has gone through the analysis of data from the last 20 years in um, uh, tourism flow population growth, waste uh, production, energy consumption, um, land use, uh, construction of uh, infrastructure, including hotels, uh, mobility, uh, carrying capacity of, of the national park uh, and marine reserve as visitor, you know, where the visitors go to. And we put them, uh, and we built a model, uh, a sustainable um, ecosystem model where we would link all these different variables, uh, taking uh, the, the, the tourism uh, as the, the main um, variable affecting these other sub-variables. So we ended up with um, a scenarios that um, is uh, giving us the information uh, for, so we, we can take that to the, to the president um, in a very short period of time. But that, that shows that uh, we are committed to have a tourism, not much in quantity, but in quality. 
So uh, this is the pretty much the result. We don't need more tourists arriving to the islands massively. Um, there's already a, a, a lot of hotels that have 25% of uh, occupancy uh, on the islands. Um, fortunately enough, fortunately enough, within the park area and marine reserve area, things are controlled. Boats are, you know, the operators are controlled. They have to renew the license every year. They have to go with a guide. We monitor the visitor sites and so on. The three percent that is outside the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Environment, it's something that is now with this study is, is being looked after very, very uh, seriously. The Ministry of Tourism has uh, put a very, very uh, clear line on what are the service and together with the Ministry of Environment, um, the environmental uh, tick boxes that they need to, to tick, no more constructions, but to build the services of the ones that are on the islands. Uh, this is a decision that, um, of course, is building up. The, the president will uh, hear soon about the, 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 the results. We just had a meeting last Monday before I came here with uh, Minister uh, Tapia. So there is a consensus that uh, the commitment of the government of Ecuador with the ministers in, in harmony uh, with the one word, one, one vision to the, towards the islands, avoid the, the increase of tourism uh, as, a, as an exponential rate which has been happening in the last uh, 10, 15 years. So that's, that's uh, some of the things that uh, are good news. Um, there is a strengthening on the work of the um, Agency of, of uh, Biocontrol for the Galapagos, the ABG we call it, where uh, I don't know if you've been flying. Th those of you that have visited the islands, uh, now we spray the the airlines, or the the airplanes when when uh, when before we land. And believe me, that's not just like that. Uh, you know, all the cans that are emptied, uh, they are um, uh, barcoding. That information uh, goes through thanks God WhatsApp. Uh, to the uh, agents in, in the mainland that they have provided those cylinders for the airline, say, okay, this is empty number, yes, they've done the job. So there's a lot of, of monitoring, there's a lot of improvement in, in, uh, in how we can control introduction of, of organisms and the flow of, of tourists uh, going to the islands. The local population is getting more aware of the restrictions, and we're getting there. We're, we're getting there. It's not a, an easy job, but... Um, Still, and I recall, we have that those islands still with 95% of its, its, its unique flora and fauna. So, uh, that that last uh, point actually um, brings us to one of the last questions. If the Galapagos Islands are unique, why not limit the number of locals living on the island to better deal with uh, ecological preservation? Uh, there's three parts to this. The, to rid the island of goats, it's not necessary to shoot them indiscriminately from planes. Why weren't they removed and sent to countries needing goats for food and milk? And the third point is momentum fades. You need to keep with it. Okay. I'm happy to take the goat. Oh, I was gonna <laughs> I was go gonna for one. it. <laughs> you want to take the goat one? Yeah. Okay. But go. it, just before you go, um, I'd like to say that, the that there's a, a, a direct correlation between the increase of tourism and the increase, increase of, of, of population. population. So when we, we then um, stabilize the, the visitors coming to the islands, naturally it will stabilize the, mm -hmm. the, the, tur the, the population growth. Uh, the goat question, I, I was the first coordinator of Project Isabella, which was the major project to get rid of goats. And, and I must say Can we just back up just a second and make sure everybody in the audience knows why do we want to get rid of goats? Okay. Goats um, were introduced to the Galapagos Islands in the 1800s to certain islands. Later on, Pinta, for example, in 1959. What happens is, Pinta is a great example. Three goats were let go on Pinta in 1959. Fishermen wanted a meat supply when they fished the northern waters. They could go on land, get some goat, eat the goat. Within 10 to 15 years, three goats had turned into 40,000. 40,000 goats move across an island and wipe out everything that's there. They destroy the vegetation. Um, they step and, on nests. Yeah, trample nests and do all kinds of things. Isabella, Alceda Volcano, which is the center volcano of Isabella, which is where we started this project. Goats arrive from the south 
in the late 1970s. By 1990, 1992, three, the population had grown to about 100,000. Okay, so first of all, we're talking about this massive mowing down machine that's destroying the habitat of iguanas, petrels, all of these unique species that are found nowhere else. So you want to get rid of them. And then the question is, how do you do that? And, and during the early years, we had lots of people saying, oh, you know, get a re refrigeration ship, bring the goats down, et cetera. When you have 100,000 animals you need to get rid of, there's no time to do all of those other things. That's one side of it. It's impossible to get to the end if you're you know, butchering them and putting them in a refrigerator boat or whatever you're doing with them. That's a logistic problem. Then there's the ecosystem problem. Everything in every one of those goats came out of that ecosystem. And ecosystems in volcanic islands that are fairly young are nutrient poor systems. So if we had removed 100,000 goats off of Galapagos, we would make them even poorer nutrient systems. So in fact, part of the restoration of the ecosystem is to let the goats go back into it. So, so you know, it's a difficult thing. They were beautiful animals. Nobody enjoyed it. But humans put them there. We needed to get rid of them. So as our last question for the day, um, we have, it's a two-part question. The first is, what is the legacy of Lonesome George? And is he foreshadowing the future? Um, do we have a chance of stopping mass extinctions? God. I, could, <laughs> I could take the, let me try the first part of that. Because when I think about the legacy of Lonesome George, I think about conservation writ large. And, and, and what happens in conservation is that it's a messy business. It's, um, it's two steps forward. It's, it's five steps backwards. It's, it, it's not linear. Sometimes it is frustratingly slow. Sometimes there are, uh, there are amazing serendipitous moments, which is not to say that everybody bumbles around in conservation, but, but you, 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 can't always, you, know, you can't always plan it. And so when I think about George and the legacy of George, what it says to me is that, that conservation um, deals necessarily with unintended consequences, and everyone on this panel, almost everyone except for me, I think, is, is a profound optimist. And <laughs> what you're not yes. an optimist. <laughs> well, you, the, you, ha, you need two. You need two characteristics. One, you need to be an optimist, and two, you need to, ha to have dogged persistence. I fall in the dogged <laughs> persistence <laughs> category. I agree with that. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree with that? I, when yes. you and I were working on permits, so, I would say yeah, dogged uh, persistence uh, was the name of the game. Um, yeah. yeah, not yeah. very bright, but oh, I didn't <laughs> say that. Plows through it. So I and I think that that's I think that's that's what conservation is. So when I see George. I think about, I think about George's legacy is sort of, you know, keep it up, folks. It's not pretty, it's not linear, but it's ultimately worth it. So that's for me, part A, George's legacy. <laughs> Applause. I <laughs> 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 figured I wasn't going to get it unless I asked for it, so there you go. We didn't give you applause at the beginning, Thanks, so you got yeah, it at the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anybody else? What was well, I'll just say that. I happened to buy the book, The Six Extinction. I don't know if you've read it, but, and started reading it on the plane trip from California to New York. And The Sixth Extinction is talking about an expected mass extinction that is starting to take place, and rather than a meteorite that's causing it, humans are causing it. And for me, it was an interesting sort of dichotomy between thinking about that, thinking about Lonesome George, what we're doing in Galapagos. And again, it keeps coming back to we just have to try harder. We have to change behavior. We have to do things differently as a world, you know, not as a specific country or whatever. Each one of us may have our, our focus. I mean, I'll continue working with Galapagos. That's my focus. But other people are working elsewhere, and we need to just keep moving this forward and or rather moving some of it backwards so it gets better uh, 
But, you know, this sort of, at, at one point I was thinking the question about what about the next 20, 30 years for Galapagos, and one of my answers is I'm very optimistic about Galapagos and very pessimistic about the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think it just means we have to work harder. Well, I guess, um, <laughs> there you yeah, go. another applause, please. <laughs> I guess uh, as an Ecuadorian, um, there's a lot of meaning uh, from a, an individual that has, has gone extinct from, from the country I come from. And um, as a manager, as a, as, as a responsible for the, for the management and, and the conservation of the islands, which I, I, I like to recall that we can not do it by our, ourselves. It's with all your help. Um, represents a a milestone. Represents a milestone in in the efforts that we we need to to continue doing. And as Linda said, there are other species there that we must work on, uh, and not just think about just one individual or or or, or, or certain species, but thinking about the the holistic way of of, of having the islands. Um, in a natural state as possible as we can. Because we are responsible, we have that commitment to the rest of the world um, to have it there. Let me, let me tell you, there is a lot of park ranges out there, like Fausto Genena and many others, with such a spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. guiding, guiding, you know, where would those tortoises be? Where would those pink iguanas be? <laughs> they know where they are. And yeah. they take, you know, those backpacks water and everything, and they go there and lead the way towards where those species are. So um, Lonesome George uh, definitely has given us this injection to, to continue working hard. Mm -hmm. And for the, the ones that are, you know, seeing beyond the islands, um, depending on the degree of, of your knowledge or sensitivity to the environment, um, that's what Lonesome George uh, represents, mm -hmm. thinking globally. On, on, on the planet. <laughs> I would just add there was a sign on Lonesome George's Corral for a while. It, it, I, I don't remember precisely, but it just said, whatever happens to Lonesome George, let him always remind us that the fate of wild species in our, is in our hands. And I yep. think that's... Yeah. It is true. <laughs> well... That was wonderful. I, I'm going to take the prerogative as the moderator, I don't do this often, to actually um, to, to answer that question myself. I, I was thinking today that, <clears throat> that this, uh, this work with Lonesome George and the reason he's upstairs is, is it reminds me of the parable or the story of Stone Soup, where everybody brought a bit of the, you know, not, nobody had all of the pieces to make the soup, but each person brought um, their piece to the soup and made a delicious soup that everyone could have a part of. And I think, that in fact, that is Lonesome George's legacy, reminding us that no matter how, who we are, where we live, what our resources are, we have something we can bring to the table and do that as a community. We can address some of these questions that we're, we're concerned about and, and avert the mass extinctions that we, we have really been concerned about. So um, in the end, it's not a sad story. It's a story of hope. It's a story of learning again to work together, to collaborate, to think about understanding the problems and finding ways together to identify solutions. Um, so please join me in thanking this amazing panel. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you.